Hi, I'm Pastor Ken. Today we're going to get into Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. But before we read the scripture, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are our God who wants us to dig into scripture and study it for everything you want us to study it for, Lord. Open our hearts and our minds to what you want us to learn, Lord, from this passage. And Lord, just let our your word be growing in our hearts each and every day. And I thank you and give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let's dig into the passage, Revelation 1, chapter, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant, servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who reads aloud the word of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written, because it is the time is near. John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first born from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming from within the clouds and every eye will see him and those, even those who pierce him. And all people on the earth will mourn him. And so shall be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. May God bless the reading of his word. Now, verse 1 starts off, it says an introduction. First three verses are an introduction. And the Greek word here for revelation is apocalypse, which we get the word apocalypse from. This word simply means revealing or unveiling. That is the purpose of the book of Revelation, is to reveal what the Lord Jesus Christ is going to do in later days. John the Apostle is credited as the author of this book. However, it is better to say he is, did, is just transcribing it. The reason that it is a book, is that the reason it's being revealed is that it will take place shortly. The, that means the book of Revelation is a book of predictive prophecy. It speaks of things that will happen in a future time, or at least a future time of writing on what is being interpretation you have of the book of Revelation. We see the word soon and we think a short period of time by our understanding of time. And since the book of Revelation was written almost 2,000 years ago, it seems that a sh to us, that's not a short time. However, the Greek phrase in Tisha that translates here as soon or shortly can better be translated and understand as coming quickly or suddenly to pass after it began. In other words, when the events that starts to happen in the book of Revelation, it will happen qu happen suddenly or quickly. We must prepare for it. 
This is the reason it is being revealed to us. We see verse 2 says, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. John, being a Jewish male, knew the Torah because it was tradition. He also knew the living word of God. He walked with the living word of God for three years. He can bear the testimony to who and what Jesus was. He was there when Jesus was crucified. He saw the empty tomb. He saw the resurrected Jesus. He saw Jesus taken up into heaven. John's testimony about Jesus was true and valid. He can be trusted. Verse 3 goes, Blessed is the one who reads aloud this word, these words of prophecy. Blessed are those who hear and who keeps what is written in it, for the time is near. This is a wonderful phrase. Throughout the book of Revelation, these are unique and particular blessings to those who read and keep the messages that are found in it. This is the first of the seven Beatitudes. Other ones are found in Revelation 14, 13, which we'll read all of them when we get there. 16, 15, 19, 9, 20, verse 6, 22, verse 7, and 22, 14. This promise here gives us more reason to believe that John knew the Holy Scripture. First, it meant for this book to be read out loud publicly, just like all other scripture was supposed to be done. Secondly, a blessing can never pronounce on a mere human book in Jewish tradition. They were reserved only for script, Holy Scripture. This shows the valid nation that this book of Revelation should be in the canon. Verse 4 starts the greeting from John. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace for him who is and who was and was and who is to come and, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. The book of Revelation was originally addressed to the seven churches in the Roman province of Asia and was the western part of the modern day Turkey. John brought the greetings from God the Father who is described as the one who is was and was to come. This speaks of his eternal nature. It is the idea of God being timeless being and is connected with his name Yahweh, which is found in the Old Testament. John also brings greetings the seven spirits who are before the throne. John's using a quote from Isaiah 11:2 to describe God the Holy Spirit here. He is not trying to show that there are seven different spirits, but the seven perfect and complete char characteristics of the Holy Spirit in its fullness and perfection. In verse 5, he goes, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from of the dead and the ruler 
of the kings of the earth. Finally, John completes the Trinity here and begins the greeting from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, by describing him as who he is and what he's done. It is interesting how John describes him as a faithful witness. The Greek word for faithful can be described as true. And the Greek word for witness can be translated as martyr. And in other words, Jesus is our true martyr who died for our sins. Here John uses the word firstborn. Does not mean Jesus was a created being. No, it means that Jesus is preeminent among all who are or will be resurrected. Jesus came to earth to die for our sins, to provide a way for us to be in heaven. He rose from the dead so that we can be with him, so that death can be conquered for us. Finally, Jesus is the ruler of kings. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. This is a title that he is above all things. John wanted us to know to that this to all people who are reading this letter. Verse 5 continues to say, To him who has loved us and freed us from our, our sins by his blood. One thing that I want to make a side note here. The Bible was originally not written with chapter and verses. And when we added chapter and verses, sometimes thoughts get cut off. And I would say this thought here to actually should go with verse 6 because it's a con it's a start of that thought and not really a continuation. It is a continuation of verse 5, but it's a new thought. But that's a little side note that I'm going to stop from there. This is a beautiful title of Jesus. This is a past tense action of agape love. And agape love is a self-sacrificing love. Because this is a this is past tense, does not mean that he does not love us anymore. He still loves us now. That is why some translation translates this to him who loves us. It is no wonder that some believe that Jesus does not love us, love them anymore because they do not see him working in the present because they get caught up in circumstances, hopping hopping around them. All they need to do is look back at the cross as the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5, 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. They will see that God loves them from the time they were born until they die. This love that he did we look back now as we as was the act of dying on the cross and paid for our sins the apostle john also wrote if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that is found in first john 1 9 Verse 6 continues the thought and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It would have been just enough to know that Jesus loves us and it cleanses us from our sins by his blood. But it goes beyond that. He made us kings and priests to his God the, and Father. As kings, we are given God's royalty, and that gives us privileges, status, and authority. 
not this, not this, it's not just our own, but one given by God. As priests, we are special servants. We are to represent God in front of man. According to Hebrews 13, 15, we are to offer sacrifices to him. In Romans 5, 1 through 2, we are we have privilege to access to the very presence of God. Now, in the Old Testament, it is forbidden to combine the offices of king and priest. King Uzziah of Judah in 2 Chronicles 26 tried to combine the two offices and paid the penalty for it. The king, King Saul, in his impatience, performed the priestly duties and got the kingship taken away from him. However, under the new covenant, it can be like Jesus is in a sense that we can be both kings and priests. In light of all that Jesus did for us by dying on the cross. In making us kings and priests, it is right that we praise him. We should always honor him with all glory and dominion forever and ever. It is not that we give him the dominion and the glory forever. It is re recognizing it only belongs to him. And verse 7 goes, Behold, he is coming in the clouds, and every eye shall see him, even those who pierce him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on the account of him. Even so, amen. This is a command to be on the lookout for Jesus' coming back. Jesus moves on from praising, John moves on from praising Jesus to describe his return. John here is returning what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 42, to be watchful for his coming. We need to be watching and keeping this in mind that he will be coming. Just like he left in Acts 1, 9 through 11 in a cloud, he will come back in a cloud. And it goes on to describe that everyone will see him. It will make you wonder, with the modern day 24-hour news cycle, could it be that we're getting closer and closer because we get to see what's going on around the world almost instantly? But God does not limit it to man's technology. He can do this miraculous thing without any help from mankind. And finally, verse 8, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and will come, the Almighty. An introduction for Jesus himself. Some scholars wonder if this is actually Jesus here speaking, or is it God the Father? However, the scholars miss the three important details found here in the book of Revelation. First, we see verse 1, that is Jesus' revelation. It is appropriate that he introduce himself. Second, the title of Alpha and Omega and Beginning of the End are titles claimed by Jesus at the end of the book of Revelation. In Revelation 22, verse 13. Third, the title, Who Is and Who Was and Is to Come, is used of God the Father in Revelation 1-4. It seems to be directed at Jesus in Revelation 11-17 and Revelation 16-5. verse 5. Jesus here gives the three title, Alpha and Omega. The Alpha is the beginning 
letter of the Greek alphabet. It means that he was there at the beginning. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet, and it symbolized that Jesus will be there at the end. If we translate this to modern terminology, Jesus says he is the A to the Z, since he is the beginning and the end. He is the authority over everything in between. The second statement he makes, who is and who was and who is to come. This title reflects Jesus's eternal nature. In his unchanging presence, Jesus is just like God the Father with the eternal nature. As Micah 5.2 prophetically expressed it, whose coming forth is from the old, from the ancient days. Or as Hebrews 13.8 expressed it, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forevermore. And on a little side note, if you want to know what my favorite hymn is, Yesterday, Today, Forever it is based on this Hebrews 13, 8, and it's my favorite hymn. Finally, the Almighty is the last title here. The word Almighty is translated from the ancient Greek word pantaker which translate which tra literally means the one who has his hand on everything this speaks of jesus's great sovereign control over everything the past the present and the future this great word almighty is used Ten times in the New Testament. All but one time is used here in the book of Revelation. That is why this book has a striking emphasis on God's sovereignty. And it shows that he has his hand on everything included. That is Revelation verses one through eight. We're going to continue in Revelation chapter one next time. And I hope you found what I taught this week enlightening and beneficial. Um, so let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are a God that helps us understand your word, Lord. And I'm glad that you are in control of everything from the beginning to the end, Lord. And Lord, help us just learn more and more about you each and every day. And look out for us every time we leave and bring us back safely next time, Lord. And I just thank you and give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Take care and I will see you next time you come back. And remember, Carpe Tilium. <laughs>